Andrew Tate, welcome to the It's Not That Deep podcast, brother. Hello. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, man. Uh, to give people a little bit of an intro, you're a four-time world uh, kickboxing champion. Uh, you're a multimillionaire with uh, numerous businesses, uh, toys, and women. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we, uh, I, I, doing my research on you a little bit, we've seen that you are the, the king of toxic masculinity. Well, and that's I, what they say, yeah. That's, that's what they say, and so we're definitely going to get into all that. But I want to start by saying something. In, uh, when I was looking at your Twitter account, the first thing I came across was your pinned tweet uh, to, uh, hating on people who watch Star Wars. And my dude, I've never related to something more in my entire life. <laughs> I yeah, went like through the it. whole thread because <laughs> I've never in my entire life watched Star Wars, consumed any Star Wars content, or understood the hype or the craze about it. And I know you're not even directly hating on Star Wars itself, but yeah. what it means and all that, and that killed me. I had, I had to put that out there. That was so funny, bro. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, I don't understand why the movie has to be your entire identity. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a joke. Like, I've never watched Star Wars, but I, I've never watched it. But right. I am sure it's not good enough for me to <laughs> sacrifice my life and my time to dedicate to this fiction. And I know there's no hot girl in the world, you know, and I'm talking about genuinely hot girl. There's no, like, supermodel who's walking the earth looking for a Star Wars fan boyfriend. Like, it's, it's bullshit. Like, it's all garbage. It's just a, it's a, it's a grown-up fairy tale for fantasists, and their fervid love for it is what I don't understand. Like, if you insult Star Wars, people get genuinely upset. Like, Absolutely. they're really going to cry. Don't worry, guys. There's, Luke Skywalker isn't real. Like, chill <laughs> the fuck out. It's crazy. It kills me, man. Like, like collecting uh, action figurines and shit, like all the different... You know, they're dedicating their life to it. But anyways, uh, continuing on a little bit, a little bit of a backstory on you. You were born in the USA, if I understand, yep. raised in the UK, and now yep. you live in Romania. Is that correct? Correct. So a bit of a jump. Yeah, born in America, raised in England, and then thought, well, I started making some money. And when you start to make money, I don't know about America, probably not so much in America, but in England, as soon as anyone gets money, all they talk about is going on holiday. Like, oh, I can't wait to get money. I'm going to go to Spain. When I get money, I'm going to go to Thailand. When I get money, I'm going to go to Dubai. Mm. And everyone works in England. And then as soon as they have money to have fun, they go abroad. Right. So once I, once I was rich, I was like, well, <clears throat> I don't need to go on holiday. I can just leave. <laughs> what do I, no one likes it here, so let's just go. Right. So and then I kind of ended up in Romania on accident. You know, it's a long story, but I ended up here and now, now I'm here and I kind of like it. So that's how it worked out. Interesting, man. Going back a little bit further than that, though, uh, growing up, you were a chess player. Is that correct? I'm still a chess player now. I still play every day. I still play every day, but I'm definitely not professional. You know, when I was young, I was a professional player. Yeah, I was okay. on route to being a champion. So you dedicated a lot of your time playing chess, learning all the different moves and all the different strategy and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, I want to talk about that, the transition from that to then becoming a fighter, because yeah. I can definitely see a lot of parallels, you know, between uh, chess and yeah. fighting, you know, yeah. in terms of strategy, the, the one-on-one -on -one matchup, you know, yeah. the, you know, thinking every move ahead and, and every move has consequences and you yeah. have to live with those consequences. Absolutely. But, Talk to me as a, as a young kid, and I, I don't know the ages, nor do I really care what age you are, but like uh, when, when you were young, when was it that like, I'm, man, fuck this chess shit, I'm going to fight? Yeah, so I, I still want, when I moved from America to England, there was no chess infrastructure like there was in America. In America, there's chess in the schools and there's these big programs and blah, blah, blah. When I went to England, I was still quite young. I was about 11 and there was no chess in the schools. There was no chess infrastructure. So chess kind of fizzled out for me. I, I, I didn't have the support network I had in America, and I didn't see a future career in it. So I wanted to do something else that was brutal. Chess is brutal. It's brutality. Like, if you play the game, you understand how ruthless chess can be. And if I tried any other sport, it just didn't have that brutality. Like, I put a ball in a net. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Like, the ball's in the net. Ooh. Yeah. It's different. Like, Chess is chess. You can really hurt somebody mentally, and fighting you get to hurt somebody for real. And like you said, it's a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Uh, one hundred percent responsibility is on you. Uh, there's, there's, you have to be a perfectionist. There's no room for error because it only takes that one shot. And uh, yeah, it just appealed to me for all the same reasons. I just guess I liked fucking people up, and <laughs> that's how it went. I decided to use my fist instead of a chess piece. Right? Were you uh, like when you were younger? Were you 
always athletic, even while playing chess and all this kind of stuff? Or was it, was there a shift? Was there a moment when, you know, I don't know, like a lot of people talk about like getting in some kind of fight or something and then realizing like, I got to get better at this. Did you no, have my, like one of those moments? No, my chess, my, my father was a, a grandmaster, mm-hmm. but he was also a big, strong guy. So my father was quite unique within the chess world. He was quite physically dominating. And for a chess player, that's unusual. So even when I won, when I was my, the, in the under 15s in Indiana, I won the state chess championship at five years old, the youngest to ever win it. And when I won it, my dad said to me, look, you need to take a month off chess and, you know, go training, go play football. You're not going to grow up to be a geek. I was never on path to be a geek. We always understood the importance of physicality right. and I was always raised to be physically capable. So it was, it's not like, uh, there are some chess nerds, but I wasn't a chess nerd. I was a chess badass. So I was always, I was always ready to kick ass. So it wasn't, it wasn't a big shift for me in that regard, really. That's dope, but it did give you like the mental, you know, being able to strategize and think ahead and learn that ruthless nature of it. And then, yeah, because that's all life is. I mean, if you can think ahead far enough, life is just cause and effect, isn't it? You, you, you do things and there's an effect to them. That's yeah. all life is. Life is cause and effect. My father used to live by cause and effect, but it's very, very true. If you, if you know that I go to the gym, I get bigger. I go on a diet, I lose fat. I work hard, I make money. It's cause and effect. People struggle with it. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. But that's all chess is as well. If you live your life by cause and effect, you're going to very easily make good choices and good choices lead to good situations and it spiral boards. Before you know it, you, you have a good life. So yeah, chess is absolutely fundamental to, to the way I view the world because it's how I grew up. But I think it can be even more simple than that. It's just a matter of understanding. Every single thing you do is a consequence and you have to decide if that consequence is worth what you're doing. Is the hangover worth the booze? Sometimes. Sometimes it isn't. It's mm-hmm. as that thousand percent man I, I couldn't relate more me uh, personally um you know my, i never really be, uh, struggled with uh, like alcohol like i never uh, would call yeah. myself an alcoholic but the last 90 days i decided i'm just not gonna drink just yeah. gonna go sober see test my mind see like you know and then yeah. So, yeah the first couple of weeks was like oh you know what it's kind of weird like going out or going to the bar or doing something and like not drinking and like yeah. you notice how stupid people can be when yeah. everyone's fucking drunk around you or like um, how it could be almost a little bit weird. Right. Yeah. But then when you realize that, you know, I'm comfortable in my own skin, like it doesn't matter. I can have just, like just as much fun without the booze. Now, right. like 90 days I haven't drank and it's like, you know, I don't even need that shit, but now I'm going to appreciate it so much more. And it comes yeah. back to that cause and effect. Yeah, absolutely. And that's also how life works, isn't it? You always appreciate what you don't have and you always appreciate things that are taken away from you. So, This is the whole point of fasting. Fasting is a huge thing now. Everyone talks about fasting all the time. But basically, it's just denying yourself something so you can enjoy it more when you have it. Mm -hmm. And and this this is a basis of life. This is human nature. If you could have everything you wanted all the time, you'd enjoy none of it. This is true. (laughs) Yeah, so you have to not have certain things. So yeah, like one of the reasons I do love to drink sometimes is because very much like you, you are now. When I was fighting, I went through long periods of not drinking. So I wouldn't drink for six months, not a drop. Yeah. And then for three, three weeks, I'd be drunk every day. And then for six months, I wouldn't drink again. That's why it was fun because of the polarity. But if you can drink anytime right. you want, yeah, it, it, it gets boring, like everything in life. Uh, I, I sense a common theme when I see some of your content, some of your videos and this kind of stuff that you are, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, an extreme person. You operate on, on, on either end of the spectrum for whatever it is that you do. You don't want to settle in the, in the middle of the bell curve and the average. Um, this, like I'm seeing this when it comes to uh, building wealth, you know, having, having your own opinions and sticking to them and, you know, giving them out and not tiptoeing over how you feel about shit and stuff like that. So we're obviously going to get into all that, but, you know, keeping it on the, on the fighting for a little bit, talk about your kickboxing journey and, uh, and, and what, what, what that was like, you know, what, what some of the wins and losses taught you. Yeah. Yeah, man. It was a, it was a long time and I kind of miss it. I miss the days of war to be honest. Part of me misses it, but I was broke as a joke, man. And I was, I just Googled, uh, no rules fighting. That's what I typed in when I was 16 years old, when I first moved to England and I found a gym run by a Bosnian guy. There was four Bosnian men, full grown men. I turned up, he he said, can you box? I said, yeah. And I got knocked out my first session. (laughs) Um, and I just kept going back. And then from there, you know, my coach never asked me if I wanted to fight. He's like, well, if you train at this gym, you have to fight. And two months later, only two months later, he gave me a date for my first fight. I just turned up. I got in the cage. I won. 
um, against some, I was only like 19. I was fighting some doorman who was like 10 kilo heavier than me, like a Jeez. doorman, like 28 year old doorman. I, I won, fuck knows how. But I was more fearless then than I, I was towards the late in my career in, in many ways because I didn't really know any better or, or really right. care. So I just kept training, man. I had a very good career. I lost a couple fights, which, which really upset me. But besides that, I basically beat everyone's ass. And that's how life goes. You can't have it all your way all the time. Right. But um, I, when I decided to retire, I guess the, the, problem, the problem with fighting is that if you want to be a competitor and you want to be the best, you have to give up absolutely everything else. It has to be all you care about. Mm-hmm. And, and one day I woke up and thought, you know what? I've achieved a lot with fighting. I've proved I can fight. I have four world titles, 80 fights. I'm all over YouTube for fighting. Like, do I need to fight and have five world titles? Do I need 100 fights? Like, is it going to change my life in any significant way? And at the time, at the peak of my kickboxing career, what people don't understand is that kickboxing is not boxing. So even mm-hmm. at the peak of my kickboxing career, I wasn't wealthy at all. Like even though I was getting 50 grand for a fight, by the time I paid my manager 20% and you're fighting twice a year, you got to pay your rent, you pay your car. Like you're not a rich person at all. No. And I, and I decided, you know what? I'm going to take all this energy I put into fighting because it's, it's all my life force. I was putting into fighting. If I, was, I was either training, asleep, or fucking. That, that was it. It's all I did. Yeah. I'm going to take, take all that life force and put it into trying to make money instead. And I did exactly that. And then within three years, I was a multimillionaire. So I kind of gave up fighting to get rich, if that makes sense. And it worked out. So That makes a lot of sense, having to give something up. Because like you said, the fighting is not something you can have one foot in, one foot out. And exactly. as soon as you start having that mentality, and I can't speak as a fighter, but I do kickbox just for fun, just for uh, exercise, but not professionally, haven't done any fights like that. But yeah. uh, just the training alone, like you can't, you can't even, like you can't just fuck around and do other shit. Like it, yep. it's just, it doesn't sync up with the lifestyle. You can't be, you can't be fucking around. And then go have a, like, go for a fucking run in the morning or go do 10 rounds or the, like, you just can't do that. Yeah. It's, it's physically all you do. And also it's mentally all you do. Cause when you have a fight coming up, it's all you think about your opponent, blah, blah, weight cut, lose weight. That it's, it's, it's your whole life. So, I mean, it was fine for a while, but I realized if I was going to do something, you said earlier about me being extreme, I, I my, my very simple life philosophy is you're going to do it, do it properly. So if I'm going to do something, I give it all I got. So I thought, you know what? I think I might have to give fighting up to truly, truly try to get rich. And that's what I wanted to do. And, and, and a lot of people want money, but I, I wanted money more than, they, than other people want money. And that's why I have money. So the day I retired from fighting, all I did or talk about or read about or research, all it was was money. I was completely uninterested in anything else. Money, I'd fuck my girls on, on what I felt like. And that was literally it. I couldn't be Star Wars. No, I didn't have time for none of that shit. It was like, no, I'll just fuck my chicks, make money. It's all I wanted to do. So just gave it the champ. That's the champion's mindset, isn't it? You, you, you give it all you got and, you, and you'll do well. thousand percent, man. You talk a lot about like escaping your comfort zone and being driven by conquest. Um, I, I watched one of your videos and you were talking about that men are inherently driven by having some kind of purpose, yeah. something that, um, you know, we're programmed to chase something and to have yeah. something uh, you know, worth waking up to fucking do. I, yeah. I, I don't know how much more eloquently to put it. Um, and this has been shown throughout history. So why don't you expand on this a little bit more and how this has driven your philosophy for life? Okay, so the, the base biological nature of man has always been to fight other men, take their land, and fuck their women. Let's, let's cut the garbage. This is the base biological nature of man. If, if you've seen the movie Conan, they said, what is the greatest? Have you seen that? Where it says, what's the greatest joy a man can experience? Uh, no. Is that the barbarian? Uh, yeah, Conan the experience with barbarian. Yeah. They said, what's yeah. the greatest joy? I can't remember the exact quote, but they say to Conan, what's the greatest joy a man can experience? And he says something like killing your enemies and hearing the lamentation of their women. So killing your enemies and taking their chicks. Yeah. So this, this, and if you look at humans, go all the way back from the animalistic terms, all these empires and nations and dynasties, all it was was a bunch of men getting together, walking in directions of fucking people up and fighting. And what, what do they do when they conquered the land? Well, they'd go, they'd take the sea, they'd bang the chicks, take the gold. There's just, there's a, there was an element of conquest inside of every man. Why did they do it? Because mm-hmm. they, didn't, they didn't have a real reason to do this. They just thought, well, let's walk over that way. Anyone gets in our way, we're going to teach them a lesson. Yeah. The natural order of man. So nowadays we live in societies, which is fine, but I don't believe much has changed. I believe that uh, the easiest way for a man to be happy is to conquer land or conquer the world financially to make a whole bunch of money so that you have freedom and to fuck a whole bunch of chicks. 
yeah. I really, I really think that can make a man happy. And, and, yeah. and, and obviously there's some other things you need and you know, you want a loving family one day and kids and blah, blah, blah. But if you give a dude $20 million and, and the adoration of a bunch of beautiful women, he's probably going to be a relatively happy person, especially if he's, especially if he's earned to himself. You know, I, I, I can't argue with that, man. And like, you know, the, the way you put it, it's so simple and it makes so much sense when you say it like that. And, uh, but if people are still going to find a way to get offended by such, of course, like it's a fact. Like, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, the reason, the reason everyone's offended by what I say is because it points out their own insecurities. Right. So that, that's what it is. If I come along and say, you want to be rich, big and strong and have women love you. The weak little guy with no girls is going to come along and call me names. And this, oh, and man, it's always the like, what? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, 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 and this is the way the world works. And, and it's kind of like the more of this hate I get, the more correct I know I am. I know that every man, every single human has a biological imperative to reproduce. Every single man has a biological imperative to find beautiful women, young, beautiful women. Every single man has a biological imperative to want to feel important. The easiest way to be happy as a man is to feel respected. If you go places and men and other people show you respect as a man, you feel happy as a man. You can't yeah. be happy as a man if you're not respected as a man. So no, how do you get how, how do you get respected? Well, you pull up in a Lambo, you have twenty mil in the bank, and you got three women with you. Now, now you're respected. Like what the fuck? So it's it's not complicated to me, but a lot of people want to deny the reality because they're not prepared to do what it takes to get there. So this is this is all it is. But it doesn't change my life. Like if you want to sit there and pretend I'm not right, you can go to Pornhub and do what you got to do. But I'm living I'm living life for real. So thousand percent, man. And you know, I saw one of your tweets and and fucking resonated with me it was the easiest way to make yourself unhappy is to measure your life purely on how happy you are a yeah. unhealth a, a healthier mindset is to accept that you don't care if you're happy or not i don't care how i feel because my decisions are conscious i never want to go to the gym but i always go and yeah. so for me that was a major shift in my life because you know a few years ago i found myself even drifting yeah you know, towards being one of those lost people and like, I have yeah. no purpose. I don't know what I'm doing, that kind of shit. Yeah. But all it really took was slapping myself in the face and being like, dude, you, like having that self-awareness, dude, just fucking go to the gym. That's just, right. just move. You, even if you don't want to, even though you don't feel like it, the society is telling us so much that you're constantly supposed to give into your feelings. But yeah. that's something that's very, I find, temporary and we're all going to go through feelings. I'm not denying that we're going to experience those things. We're fucking humans. But yeah. if you just give into that shit and be like, Oh, well, I'm just going to Netflix all day or Pornhub or whatever you say, like, yeah. you, do you think that's going to make you happy? Like, yeah, and this, this is the thing, the basic tenant, if someone asked me to define masculinity, I would define it as, uh, feeling a certain way and doing so, and, and doing the opposite or ignoring how you feel. It doesn't matter how I feel about the gym. It doesn't matter if I feel like going to work. None of that's important. I do what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. The part, the point of being a man is ignoring how you feel and doing your duty, having duty, having honor and performing regardless of how you feel. That's the whole point of being a man in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing about it. And that's why how you feel isn't that important. Like people always talk to me about happiness and I say, you spend all your time measuring your happiness. If you're gonna, if you're gonna focus purely on measuring your first happiness, first of all, how do you even do that? Yeah, exactly. And you're gonna notice, you're gonna notice mass. You're gonna really feel the differences. Yeah. If I wake up and I'm a bit pissed off, but I still go to the gym, I still go to work, I still do what I got to do. It doesn't really affect my day. It doesn't, it doesn't really cross my mind. How I feel doesn't have any impact on how I really live my life. And I think that this stoicism is something that a lot of men are starting to lack nowadays because they're taught that they need to give in to their emotions and feel their emotions. What's actually my bigger point about all of this is this. Who said we're supposed to be happy all the time? Who come along and said that that's the rule? Who come along and said that we are supposed to be happy? It's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale. We're not supposed to be happy. Yeah. You're supposed to be miserable. And yeah. that's what drives you to do things. Mm -hmm. That's what this whole conquest is about. So if you were happy without any achievement, then we wouldn't have cities and the pyramids and none of this shit. The whole reason the human, the human society exists is because we were annoyed having less than we had. So this right. is the normal natural state of man and you need to just get over it. I haven't got time for people who are going to sit there and cry about being unhappy because happiness is on top of a mountain. So if you don't climb it, then you don't deserve happiness. You, you right. can make yourself happy. Go get it. You don't want to get it. So if you don't want to get it and stay miserable, just don't message me. I have very little sympathy for these kind of people. And I've been mm -hmm. attacked before in the past about my, 
unfair stances on on mental health but i don't think it's unfair i just expect every full-grown man to take responsibility for himself and his life and i, I think it's as simple as that well i think like you know if you if you're looking at you know the people who are going to be uh, lashing out on you or, or whatever showing how they feel about your stances on this stuff I don't think they're boiling down the message and having these kinds of conversations with you because even me, when I see, uh, when I see a, a, a headline, like depression is not real. Yeah. Okay. That, okay. That catches my eye. Okay. Wait, what does this guy mean? I thought like depression is real. Let me look into this. And then I, I see what you're actually saying. Oh, he's not actually saying that depression doesn't exist. What he's really saying is a, a lot of what people are calling depression is a lack of some other things. Absolutely. And so like, uh, so feeling depressed is real, but the idea that depression as a disease will strike your mind from the sky, no matter how good your life is and there's nothing you can do about it, is not real. You feel depressed because you're reacting to, to your situation. The reason jail is a punishment is because you're depressed in jail. If, if you were happy in jail, then it wouldn't be a punishment, would it? So you, you're reacting to your external stimuli. So if you're unhappy and you feel depressed, then there's something in your life you need to change. If you refuse to change that, then you will stay depressed. That's not called a disease, that's inaction. Inaction is not a disease. So I've had people come to me and go, oh, I'm fat because I'm depressed. I'm like, no, you're depressed because you're fat. Yeah. Like you, they got it the wrong way around. So yeah. you know, inaction, inaction is always gonna, it's always, you're always gonna pay the price for an action one way or another. And this whole idea that, oh, depression, depression, boo hoo, poor me. And all they're doing is looking for sympathy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'll tell you now, man, like if you're, if you're a fat, if you're fat and you're home and you're lonely and you have no girlfriend and you're depressed, taking a pill is not going to, is okay. Maybe it will mask some of the symptoms, but you still have no girlfriend. You're still fat. Like, wouldn't you rather just go gym and get a girl? Really? Like, but, but laziness yeah. is, is man, it's all just laziness. And yeah. this is the thing that's the truth about it. Yeah. The truth about it is this people, when they think they're being sympathetic to these, these, these depressed people, they're just enabling them. Man, You're enabling you, people. And, and here's the thing. Like, I'm by no means like a mental health expert or anything. Yeah. But as someone who uh, had an identity uh, as an athlete my whole life, yeah. you know, growing up, always being an athlete, yeah. you know, always just, you know, being athletic and doing sports and stuff, when that was taken away from me yeah. uh, through injuries and whatever, yeah. long story, it doesn't matter. And I gained some weight. And you know, I started like you know feeling down, and I I can never say I was depressed because I know I wasn't, but I was down, man. I was like, fuck, look, I put on this weight, all this shit, blah blah blah. But that I then I went and did something about it. I'm like, exactly. let me just let me just like go like tackle this problem, get that confidence back, and just be like, it's all good. I'm not just gonna identify with, oh fuck, I guess I'm depressed now. That's it. Yep, it's a uh, cop out, and, and that's exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. Because what the reason when I said depression wasn't real, everyone lost their minds is that depression is the ultimate cop out for failure. I'm failing in my life. I'm not doing what I say I'm, I want to do, but I'm depressed. They think it's a, it's a cure all. This is my excuse for everything. And if you take away people's excuse, then they don't like it because now they have no excuse. Now, why are you not going to the gym? Oh, you're actually a lazy bastard. Oh, you don't want, you don't want to admit that. And, so and you're seeing that now. It. You're seeing that now more than ever. All the same motherfuckers who are like, "Oh, I wish I had more time to work out. Oh, I yeah. wish I, I wish okay. I could, yo, I, I wish I could, like, you know, have a home gym or like, oh man, if I work from home, life would be amazing." All right, there you go. You, you yeah. got it. Boom, it's a genie in a bottle. Here's all the time. Here, work from home. Here, you can literally go for a run three times a day if you wanted. You can yep. cook all your meals at home. You can literally, you're in complete control of this situation. Oh man, this being at home's got me all sad. I don't want to work out. All right, man. It's yeah. the problem, the, the, like the gym, it's the problem. No, you have all the tools like in Western society. And, and the big point is the big thing that you said there that I think, you know, people are going to listen to this and they're still going to get triggered. They're still going to be upset. Oh my God. He's like completely uh, disregarding depression or mental health, all this boil down what, what you're saying for me personally, I can't say this about everyone, but for me personally, it didn't help me when anyone was enabling me when I was in that situation. It didn't help me when people were like, Oh, it's okay. Like, Oh no, no, that's fine. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have that extra burger. 
yeah, 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 yeah. Like, no, no, no problem. Here's some, here's some extra, I don't know, fries or whatever. I don't know, whatever bullshit. No, what helped me was the harsh messages. Yeah. Yo, dude, you're getting fat. Yeah. Yo, dude, get your shit together, bro. What the fuck's yeah. going on? And that, that, that's what made me change. Because life's harsh. This is the thing. Life's harsh. Harsh messages are realistic messages. This is welcome to the real world, motherfuckers. You want, like, you want a message that's going to have any kind of weight. It's going to be a harsh message. Mm-hmm. And this is people are trying to hide themselves from harsh realities and just live in some kind of fantasy dream. Yeah. I, I, you should never, when I said depression wasn't real, I had a lot of people attack me trying to change the way I think. And I, and I tweeted something back then. I've been banned on that account by now, but I had tweeted and I said, why would I adopt the thinking of unhappy people? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy and, I'm, and I live a successful life and I have everything I want. Yeah. So why are you going to come along and tell me that I'm wrong to think the way I think? And I'm going to be like you, the guy who won't get out of bed because he's too sad. Like, why would I want to adopt a single iota of your mindset? So you can fuck off. I, I know I'm right. And you, you think I'm wrong, but also look at the way your life is. Like, do I want your life? No. So I don't mm-hmm. want to listen to you. And this is another thing about the depression thing. If depression wasn't an excuse for people, I was talking to one, one guy approached me in my inbox and he was quite nice. So we had a conversation. He was saying how depression's real, blah, blah, blah. I said, listen, if you're not using depression as an excuse for your failure, and it's genuinely a plague on your life, and you see me, who has never been depressed ever, ever, yeah. surely you should be trying to adopt my thinking as opposed to trying to change mine to yours. Like, surely I know something you don't know. If it's, if it's not an excuse and you really just want the cure, well, I'll tell you the cure. Think like me. You know, oh, yeah, but, you know, you have motivation. What does that mean? What does that even yeah. mean? Yeah. Oh, what don't is, get me started on this. Bro, don't get me started on this whole motivation thing. Because my whole life I've heard this word and it never actually really made any sense to me. Because, yeah, we all know what it feels like to have some uh, inspired moments and motivation where you're pumped up to do something. Yeah. But that's fleeting. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's never going to carry you through those days where you got to get like drag your ass to like the gym or wake up and go for a run or wake up and do some shit very early that you didn't want to particularly yep. do or, yep. Oh yeah. I'd love to sleep in that extra hour or whatever. No, yep. fuck it though. Like it's, uh, it, it's not that I'm motivated to get up and do it. It's yep. discipline. Like yeah, I, exactly. it's discipline. Exactly. If you have discipline, you don't need motivation. No, I, I completely don't believe in motivation uh, to as a long term thing to carry anyone through any result it could be a spark but even then i think that's like weak as shit when i played football i used to uh, i used to think that motivation was real i used to yeah. uh, watch the pump up videos and yeah, yeah, yeah. big big hits and like you know like crazy like you know music playing and like yeah, yeah get amped up but i remember someone told me he's like yo what are you doing all that like what's all that shit like i'm like i don't know like it's pumping me up he's like if you need something external to pump you up, yeah. then you must not be confident in your ability or you haven't practiced enough or you're not ready. Yeah. I'm like, that shit hit me. I'm like, bro, I carry that shit for the rest of my life. I'm like, I don't need to have music playing to pump me up. Do I like it? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm not saying don't ever listen to music, but don't rely on something external to bring out some result. Absolutely. It has to come from within and that's discipline. That's, that's yeah. self-awareness. And we're back to cause and effect again. We're back to the, the, the very basis of life, isn't it? Cause and effect. Oh, you have motivation. No, I just understand cause and effect. And I live by those principles. I know if I work hard, I'll make more money. I know if I train hard, I'll have a better body. I know if I get out of bed, I'll do more things. And if I stay in bed, it's cause and effect. And you know that as well as an adult. You just want to pretend it's not true. And you want an excuse to not perform, an excuse to not do anything. And depression is the excuse you come up with. And that's why they hate when you attack their excuses because you attack their entire identity. You attack their religion. And then they just call you names and call you insensitive. And they insult you on the internet like everyone does to me. And I continue to be a successful millionaire and they continue not to be. And it is what it is. And it doesn't bother me one I owe. And that's life. It's up to them. But uh, I mean, I've said this a million times when I've met people who are sad or depressed. They say, listen, you need to stop talking about this shit and get some work done. Stop talking. What, are we, what is these words? Oh, I'm depressed. Don't, shut up. Let's get down. Let's do some stuff. You know, because it's all you're living in some fantasy in your, in your mind. And, and if you live in the real world, that crap will get knocked out of you pretty quickly, I'm pretty sure. That kind of brings me to, uh, you know, some of your views on Western society as a whole. Do you think it's people's fault that they've been conditioned to think this way? Like, do you think 
there's a lack of people like yourself out there to actually, for lack of a better word, show them the light, like guide them, like, hey, look, it's like all these things you've been taught are quite frankly false. Yeah. Like, do you think that that is people's fault to not seek that stuff out on their own? I, I wouldn't say it's their fault. I think a lot of people don't understand the reasoning behind why a lot of this garbage, such as depression, is propagated and supported by the media and Hollywood. Okay, if you're a Hol- if let's say you're in Hollywood, you have 100 million followers. Do you think you can just say whatever you want? Do you think you can just say your opinion? Or do you think there's people who say, no, you can, you can say this, you can't say that. You can say this, you can't. You can't just have 100, 200 million followers and start spouting your mouth off about what you think because you're controlled because you're part of the agenda. You're basically well, they got God. publicists. They yeah, got exactly. This, they got that. Yeah. yeah, you're basically God to to people. You know, you're you're worshipped, and everything you say has weight. So that's the reason they'll turn them all against Trump. That's the reason they will uh, get all these Hollywoods tweeting about depression all the time. So why is depression as a whole? Let's stand the depression subject because it's one of many. There's many, but let's just stick to this one. Why is depression as a whole propagated by the by the machine? Why does the, why does the West want people depressed? And the simple answer is because when people are weak minded, it's easier to control them. So if you have a society, all you need is a few strong-minded men, a few brave men to do the law enforcement and go die in a desert somewhere. And everyone else you just want as a tax slave. You don't give a shit about their happiness. You just want them as paying taxes, doing a job they hate, depressed, but you know, so they don't rebel or resist or think for themselves too much. Because if you're depressed, you're self-obsessed. If you're depressed, you're selfish. If you're depressed, all you think about is what's in your head. You don't care about the world anymore. You don't care about anyone else. You don't care about society. You don't care about other people. All you care about is yourself. You're caught up in this spiral of self-obsession. I'm depressed. I'm depressed. I'm depressed. They want people depressed. They want you sad and going to work and coming home and taking your pill and doing your job and paying your tax. And, and especially as a man, I mean, they, they care a little bit about women happiness, but the world doesn't give a shit about men being happy. They don't care about men being happy at all. We, we, well, we were thousand percent, man. We, we were the fodder to die for the longest time. Mm-hmm. And you look at the life of there's many men in America or the West today who are going to work, working hard, making money, coming home, spending all their money on a wife and kids. The kids don't listen. The wife doesn't suck dick. They're fucking basically suicidal and they just keep going to sleep, getting up and going back to work and it's just a never ending cycle and they can't leave the woman because they're gonna get divorce destroyed. And it's just a depressing existence. But do you think the government gives a shit? No, it doesn't, it doesn't care, but it doesn't care. So this whole depression narrative is propagated and it's, it's supported, it's insulated and it's, it's pushed on people because the weaker someone's mind is, the less chance they are to wake up. The truth is this, there are, there are, there's only two genuine groups in the world. You've got the rich and the poor. This, this is it. There's, there's nothing else. And what the rich do is they try and keep the poor fighting. So they talk about race and Democrat, Republican, this, that, yeah. blah, blah. They keep everyone fighting for too keep long. Keep them divided. Yeah. Keep them divided because there's a lot more of them than there is elites. You know, and the elites also need the poor people to go die for them. When the elites decide they need to go blow something up in Afghanistan, they send the poor people to do it. They don't send their own kids to do it. They send poor kids to do it. So they, the elites need the poor. So one of the other tools the elite use, as well as dividing, is to make sure these people are not strong-minded. If you have a whole bunch of strong-minded poor people together, then you have a revolution. You don't want that. Mm-hmm. So you have to make sure that they're all depressed, sad, fighting with each other, arguing about imaginary racism. And this is what and the whole drinking their pain away and just drinking you know, saying, drugs, Xanax, Netflix, yeah, Netflix garbage. And yeah. this is what the whole machine anything does. to keep you distracted from actually having to confront these issues head on. And, anything and, to keep you distracted from waking up and realizing you're getting fucked. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. because this is the reality. Most people are getting fucked over by a system. I mean, I'm not. I'm a right wing guy, but even I believe in certain things. Like at least in England, there's universal health care. How are you going to live in America, give away half your money in taxes and not be able to go to a hospital? It's a fucking joke. Like, they, yeah. you know what I mean? They have unlimited money for bombs. They can blow shit up in the desert all day. Yeah. But they can't give, they can't give you a Band-Aid. It's garbage, <laughs> bro. It's, 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 the whole system's garbage. And, and yeah, man. You, you can analyze it on a really, really intricate level. But the very simple basis of it is they don't want, they don't want too many strong-minded people. They want people who watch TV and believe what they're told. And if you make those people depressed, they're more likely to believe your crap. So that's why they push the whole agenda. They don't want people like me who says, no, I don't believe that. No, I don't believe that. No, that's not true. What yeah. good am I to the system? No, you know, exactly. I'm no good to the system. I make my own money and I fucked off to Romania and I'm a millionaire in Romania and I refuse to talk, you know, to, talk to any of these people. So they don't want people like me. They want people who are just cogs in the machine. And, and that depression is an element of that, along with many other things. But that's one of the reasons depression is so propagated by the media. That's my belief. 
Damn, man. I, I love how you put that. I, I'm, this is why I started a podcast. I'm learning shit. Like yeah. even, even I thought I had an idea of like what your opinion on that was, but now the way you put it, that actually makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I don't, I don't know if you're like much of a, a conspiracy person or, or stuff like that, but do you have like, uh, do you have any opinions on like what's going on right now worldwide with this whole COVID thing uh, and how, how that fits into any of this, this stuff as well? Yeah, the COVID thing is super interesting because it's, it's never happened before. So, I mean, I've, I can guess and I can speculate. It's definitely super interesting. Um, I, I am very surprised by what has happened. I'm not entirely sure why the entire world's bought into it. I think it's still down to, I still think there's a Trump element to this in regards to Trump has completely changed the world in a massive way. And even if you don't like Trump, you have to admit that before Trump came along, people didn't believe or understand that the news was fake. Trump has come along and proved that a lot of the news is purely fake. It's fake right. news, it's propaganda. And that's changed things in a massive way. And I kind of think that when Obama was president, there was also an outbreak of swine flu and people were dying. I didn't even know that until this coronavirus thing came out. And they were talking about the, the swine flu that happened when Obama was president. And no one even spoke about it. No one cared because the media didn't mention it because everyone liked Obama and life carried on as normal. But because all of the media hate Trump, if even one person died, that person's face would be all over the news and all of the newspapers forever. So Trump has no choice but to lock down and the, the world follows America because America's the leader of the world and blah, 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 blah. So yeah. I kind of think that, you know, it could have been as simple as having a president people liked and the president saying, no, we're not going to lock down. If America stayed open, most of the world would have stayed open. You know? Interesting. They're um, following so, America's lead. Yeah, so there was and, a few- And I can relate like, with that, like, pretty hard because as a Canadian- that's our yeah. biggest trading partner and Canada relies on the U S for so much. Yeah. And so when you hear even like, I don't watch the news personally, like I don't really know. Yeah. I don't watch that shit or, or know really what's going on. But when you hear people talking and you know, like, Oh yeah. Like, did you hear like Trump's cutting off a, a, a selling of masks to Canada and this yeah. kind of shit. It's just like, man, I don't even know what to like, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. even know what to fucking trust or, or, anymore yeah so, this is what i mean yeah it's, it's all fake and and there are a few countries that locked down before america but i believe if america didn't lock down there would have been other countries that didn't lock down so a couple of weeks ago i was in sweden when the lockdown started the only country in the world that hasn't locked down is two countries belarus and sweden okay. i couldn't get to belarus so me and my brother went to sweden i've got it all on my twitter we went to sweden in the height of the coronavirus pandemic pandemic about 11 days ago and stockholm is open as normal Cafes are full, restaurants are full, everyone's on the street as normal. You can get coffee. We were in the club. We had vodka, bottles, da da da. Everything was completely normal. Yeah. And there's no no one's dying there at any higher rate. Interesting. So it just kind of goes to show that, you know, something's happening. I mean, I, I'm no I'm no expert on diseases, but my personal mm -hmm. view is very, very simple. I look at life, like you said, we talk about chess. I look at life very rationally. And my rational conclusion is this. If four out of five people who get COVID don't show symptoms, this has been agreed by the news. They said four out of five people are asymptomatic. Of the one out of five people who show symptoms, only a small percentage of them die. So that means if that's the case, would the World Health Organization identify this disease instantly? Well, the answer to me is no, because if the disease first came out and most people who get it don't show any symptoms and the people who do get it, a lot of them don't die. And the ones that do die, it's yeah. of pneumonia. How long is it going to take for the World Health Organization to even sit and go, okay, this is a brand new disease? It's going to take a right. long time for them to even work it out because they're not testing for it. They've just got people dying of pneumonia. Like they and do then, every day. And then isn't it dangerous to put give them so much power over the whole entire world, uh, even in terms of us having discussions like this? Like if I, uh, if I put this up on YouTube, I heard now YouTube is taking down any content that goes against what the America, World Health yeah. Organization says. If I yeah. start to say, hey guys, like if you're young and healthy and uh, you know, you're, yeah. you take your fucking vitamins, I don't know, you're just a relatively health, healthy person who's not immunocompromised. If yeah. I say that, they, they might take it down. Like, so uh, at what point do you start to think, okay, well then this fucking World Health Organization, they have a lot of control over this narrative, man. Yeah, they absolutely do. And, and this is my exact point is that I believe the virus has been around for a long time. I don't think they would have identified it in its infancy. It's probably been around for two years. It's probably been spread all over the world. Loads of people got it and got better. Dude, I, I think I had it. Honestly, back in fucking like December, January, there was yeah. like this fucking 30, 20 day period where I would wake up in the middle of the night with like just like a slight cough, nothing crazy. Yeah. 
And that's yep. never happened to me before. But yep. otherwise, I was completely fine. I'm exactly. like, bro, I fucking had this COVID shit. And that's yeah, that's what I mean. So it's been around forever. And that's why the whole lockdown's stupid. Because yeah, the people yeah. who, you know, people were dying of it, of yeah. it. And no one even noticed until the whole media hype. The media yeah. hype controls the world. It always has, it always will. And, and this is how it's spun. So it is what it is. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about, um, you know, what you're kind of known for uh, on your side of the internet. Now, I ventured into this world a little bit when I was looking at you and it fucking blew my mind. I didn't even know there was something called the manosphere. I did not even know about like red pill. Uh, yeah. I, I learned a new word, simp. Didn't even know what that meant. All yeah. this, all this kind of shit. Talk to me, uh, you know, a little bit about how you feel about how you've been positioned. And obviously you're doing a good job capitalizing off of it, but kind of, yeah. Kind of like taking a step back from it. How do you personally feel about where you, you've been pushed? What's yeah, that? so yeah, so I've, I've kind of ended up there on accident. I was definitely not a red pill guy. I'm definitely not a manosphere guy. I'm a kickboxing world champion. So the red pill, anyone who's listened to this, red pill is, is a, te- a saying taken from the matrix where you take the red pill, you see the real world. And the red pill is about the real world about women. So it's about how to get girls and the truth about how women think and how to be a man and how to have good relationships with women and how to avoid getting destroyed in divorce court and all these kind of things. A lot of the guys who are in this space are simply dudes who got married, got divorced, got upset about it, have their heart broken and can't get over it. And they're still big babies. That's the truth about most of them. And they try and come across super masculine, like tough guys, but it's very easy to see the reason their motivations behind what's happened to it is that they're upset. They have trauma. A girl left them, won't suck their PP anymore. And they're, they're, they're being little bitches. Mm-hmm. I ended up there on accident. And the reason why is because one of the companies I was running was a webcam company. So I had girls working for me. Um, I had beautiful girls online sitting, talking to guys and taking the guy's money. So when I was, when I got, well, got on Twitter, everyone found out I had this webcam company and I kind of ended up going in the corner of that space. Cause they're like, okay, well, all these guys talk about how to get girls. Right. This, this dude has 20 girls working with him for him, living with him and paying him money. And they're all hot. They're all super hot girls. We want to learn from Tate. Tate, Tate has a different angle on it all. So then they just basically put you on this pedestal of this guy's, this guy's the God. He's good at well, pick up somebody, or, or getting yeah. big ass some, chicks and shit. Yeah. Some guys believe that. I mean, there's some manosphere creators who don't like me and disagree with me, but that, that's only because they're jealous. I mean, they, they can't perform with me in, in a female metric. I'm, this is definitely not a dick measuring competition. We're not going to sit here and say who does better with girls, but to brag about being able to get laid is completely different than bragging about having women make you a multimillionaire and living with right. you and having 10 women like the Playboy Mansion. Right. Well, and I, I what definitely, I've done is a different level. Yeah, definitely. I want to get into that as well. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you've basically set up these relationships with these women to actually make a money for you on these on these campsites. That's yeah. fucking mind-blowing in and of itself. But just sticking, sticking to this for a second, like, you know, you've leaned into this. And you, yeah, you, I have. Tell, yeah. you, you know, you could tell that, you know, a lot of these people, are, and I'm probably, bro, people are going to fucking comment like crazy on this fucking, uh, on this fucking video. Like, what is this guy, blah, 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 this and that. I don't really give a fuck. I just think it's very funny how passionate some of these people are in your, in your tweets and your Instagram on this and that about just, anything you put out like it's it's got to be kind of entertaining a little bit as well like do you soak it all in sometimes i've become a bit of a leader and the reason i've become a bit of a leader is because i kind of have the poster life of what everyone thinks they want right I, i have a whole bunch of beautiful women i have nine supercars i have a mansion i say what i want i i don't have to apologize to anybody I can upset everybody and nobody can come for me anyway. Like I've got a degree of freedom that people like. So I definitely try and I know there's a lot of people I inspire. Um, and you know, I never really went out trying to be like a leader of men or anything. I just lived in my life and saying what I believe. And there's people who latch onto it, but a lot of the people who've latched onto it have definitely improved their lives. So I have a private community called the war room. You can see it on cobratape.com and there's only 500 men in there who I deal with on a day-to-day basis and I train them. And everyone who's joined the war room has made more money. They have better business connections. They may have, you know, more women or whatever their goal was. Everyone's smashing it. So yeah, I guess I kind of ended up a leader. I did kind of lean into it a little bit, but I, I never intended on being. The difference between me and these red pill guys is these red pill guys, their life was all about pussy. My life was all about achievement and the pussy was an accident. So it was just a very yeah, different that- angle on it. 
yeah it's almost like you can almost view it like the same way you you view money it's like you know it's a result it's just gonna it's it's a yeah. byproduct of just being yourself and being confident and exactly. knowing that you can achieve whatever yeah. uh, that that was a bit of a reach with the comparison but just 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 ride with no me. but it's, it's true no it's, <laughs> it's, no it's true if, if you're competent yeah. you know then anything yeah. you're gonna have a whole bunch of benefits in, in all regards and, and women is one of them there's a lot of these red pill guys their whole life is just talking about how to get girls but they don't do anything outside of that so every time they meet a girl the girl realizes there's not much to them you know besides a few pickup lines they've learned on the internet and and, and it's the truth and a lot of the guys to be honest are just bitter and they're and they're trauma filled and they talk about girls all day long to try and deal with their own personal trauma about the fact that they've been divorced raped and blah blah blah, mm. blah. i I've, I've never been divorced no girls ever left me no girls ever ruined my life in any way so you know my life's always been positive my interactions with females has always been positive so i, I don't really like to consider myself red pill because a lot of those dudes are just heartbroken dudes that's the truth yeah man and i can i could feel that even just looking through some of the shits like god damn this is they hate they hate girls and they, they hate yeah girls. it's almost yeah. like it's almost like like the, like what's going on here time out like yeah. why would you not like fucking love everything about women not everything about women but fuck with women like for yeah. for women not not anyways it, it's just weird to me but anyways yeah. Uh, switching gears a little bit from that, um, there's a quote on, or one of your tweets is like, this fucking cracked me up, bro. Was, being rich is the solution to being poor. <laughs> and it's so, it's so fucking cleanly put that I might have to like throw that up on a quote somewhere, man. Well, it's the but only solution I could think of. It, it makes a lot of sense when you just put it that way, but you weren't always rich. And you know, you talk about being dead broke at some point. Um, you know, having, having hard time, even like buying food and making ends meet and stuff like yeah. that. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, when you actually decided to make that switch from just being a kickboxer and, and you know, making whatever modest income you were making there to like, all right, you know what? I need to actually build a, a, few, a business, multiple businesses to actually yeah have multiple streams of yeah so the, it was a simple conversation with my brother we were discussing whether we should move to thailand or not and what appealed to us about moving to thailand is that in thailand no one wears nice clothes no one has a lamborghini everyone just walks around in shorts and t-shirt on the beach and no one gives a shit and and the view was i said to tristan i want to move to thailand he said why and i said the west is a capitalistic society so if i can't play the capitalistic game i don't want to i don't if i can't win the capitalistic game i don't want to play and my exact line, he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, if I can't afford a Lambo, why do I want to live in America or England or anywhere in the West? Because there's people with Lambos and I don't have one. So why would I even want to play the game? Like, why would you play a game you're losing? So my view was quit the game and go to Thailand and then I ain't got to play anymore. That was, so that was my view on money. Like, if I can't be rich, I don't want to live in a society that values money so much. And I know the Thais value money. Everyone needs money to eat. But my point is no one's going to be like, ah, you're, you're 40, but you're broke. In Thailand, no one gives a shit. Like right. It's just a different mentality in, in the, the world. So it's kind of funny because I said literally a Lambo. Now I have a Lambo outside and a McLaren and a Aston Martin and a Porsche and all these cars. But um, that was the basic view of it. And I said, look, I'm going to give up kickboxing. I dedicate myself to trying to make money. So it was a long, long story how I ended up mm -hmm. making money. And I, I won't just tell the whole thing because it's really long. But uh, I ended up stumbling across this webcam thing, scrubbling, seeing. I was trying to identify where money moves. So I always understood, even when I was fighting, I ran a few different businesses, a few different hustles. I was always like a hustler. I always understood how to get money in. And I wouldn't consider myself a businessman. I was a hustler. And when you're a hustler, you identify how money moves. You identify where it's moving and you stand in the middle. So if my friend wanted to buy a motorcycle, I'd be like, oh, I know a guy with a really great bike. I didn't even know a guy. <laughs> but, I'd, I, but I'd find one on the internet and I'd add a couple hundred bucks on top. And you know, I was always trying to fucking find money. Yeah. And, um, and my view on money is that it's like water. Water is always moving. And if you stand in the middle, you're going to get wet. So wa water is in a river and then it, it, the sun comes and it evaporates. It goes into a sky, it rains, it goes down to a lake. And then it's always moving. There's always a, a, a cycle of water. You just have to be in the right place at the right time and you're going to get some. So I was trying to identify where money was moving. And I found these men sending money to webcam girls. And I thought, well, why don't I get girls and train them to be webcam girls and be their manager and, and pro handle all the tech support and, and, you know, the emotional support because there's an emotional side to the job as well. And uh, that's kind of what I did. And, and long story short, it made me millions of dollars. And that was the beginning of it. And I opened up a whole bunch of other stuff from there. So, Yeah. So then from there, you went to doing kind of, you know, 
positioning yourself as that leader and, and, and having all these courses and these memberships and stuff as well, right? Uh, that's another side of your, your business, like kind of the mentorship, the coaching, that kind of shit. Uh, and then there's also like, was there some casino thing you, you're doing as well? Yeah, so I've got, I've got CobraTape.com where I sell all the information I have. And the reason I started CobraTape.com wasn't to make money. I was, already, I was already rich before it started, but I kept getting emails from people. Tate, I want to know what you know about women. I've seen, the, I've seen the pictures on your Instagram. I've seen the kind of girls you have. I need to know what you know. Or Tate, I want to run a webcam business. Or Tate, will you teach me this? So I just put it all together in the courses. And one of the reasons for that was it saves me having to email the same thing over and over again. So CobraTape.com, you can learn everything I know from start to finish. Everything mm -hmm. I know about business is in the Hustlers University. Every single thing I know about how to become rich is in there. Every single thing I know about how to run a webcam business, I'll teach you. Every single thing I know about how to get girls, I'll teach you. You got Forex in there as well. Everything. Everything yeah. I do to make money, I'll teach everybody everything. Right. That's CobraTape.com. And, and then now I've recently invested. I'm opening 12 casinos in Romania. So slot arcade mm -hmm. casinos. So that's some more money. And then, yeah, I mean, I'm, financially, I'm doing very well. I've definitely got enough money. I don't need more money. Um, but I, I, I don't, I, I believe in working hard, but also I believe in enjoying my life. So I'm just going right. to get these casinos open and then I'm going to, you know, go driving around the continent for the summer. And if this virus ever disappears, you know, have fun. <laughs> so that's, that's the plan. That's dope, man. Uh, I feel like you've reached a pretty dope stage in your life. And obviously having just met you like only like an hour ago, I think it's pretty, it's pretty cool to see that journey because me personally, I see myself in that more, uh, beginning hustler stage yeah. you know I just launched a business a, a couple months ago and it's it's doing pretty well and you know my whole relationship to money has changed having um having immigrant parents and you know yeah. god bless them love them to death but you're taught scarcity you're, yeah, you're yeah. taught uh, to to save and be frugal yeah. with your money yeah. and, and and hoard it keep it close yeah. to your chest but yeah. now you know from from learning from you know uh some I, i've invested in some uh, like coaching and stuff myself and yeah. have learned a lot of these things that i needed to unlearn in order yeah, yeah. to get good at business. And now I'm yeah, closing yeah. deals that I never thought, like I could never imagine that kind of money when I'm only thinking about money in terms of selling your time for a salary. Yeah, there's two things. You, one, you can never save yourself rich. I mean, I'm not oh. saying be, yeah, like this doesn't mean you have to be irresponsible with money, but the idea that you're gonna save and one day be rich is garbage, it's never gonna happen. You can't save yourself rich. Um, if, if you look at- I've Not anymore you, anyway, maybe yeah. in like, fucking 1980 or some shit like if exactly you, if you had a nice corporate pension and some shit and you saved yeah. your money and put it in a savings account maybe then maybe yeah. now it's a completely different ball game man completely different you have to earn yourself rich you gotta get your income up that's the first thing and that's the yeah. most important thing a lot of people don't understand and the second thing i say to people the number one bit of advice i'll say for making money is uh when i was trying to make money all i spoke about was money so all my friends were different kinds of business owners. And if I met them, all we talked about was money. So if one of them had a window cleaning company, one of them had a, a food outlet, one of them had, it doesn't matter what it was, all I, we'd be talking about is house business, is it up, is it down? Is there any way I can help you with this? Oh, you've got a window cleaning company. Well, he has a food outlet. Why don't you go clean the windows on his and he can give you free food for your staff. And, then, and it was always us trying to work together. And all we spoke about was money. If, all, if, you're, if you're in a conversation, if you talk about ice cream all day, every day, you're going to learn a lot about ice cream. It's very simple. If for six months, everyone you talk to in your spare time talks about ice cream, you're going to know a whole bunch about how ice cream's made, flavors, how it's stored, how it's transported. You know everything. Thousand percent, it's, man. it's the same with money, but most people don't talk about it. They meet their friends. They talk about video games and Star Wars. And yeah, they, they have a few beers and they just talk about irrelevant bullshit. And yeah, it's also I, about surrounding yourself with people who are going to elevate you, yeah. right? Making sure that you're, you're having conversations with people that are actually going to make you a little uncomfortable. Like, yeah. make you a little bit like, like jabs. You need people that are going to like... And it, it comes back to, you know, cause and effect. And, and yeah. it, it comes back to having people not enable you and, you know, be like, oh, yeah, what was that? Like, you know, you, you, I, I, I like sports, too. Don't, I'm not going to yeah. say I'm some person who just never watches sports, but I'm not here watching like fucking every sport. Yeah, yeah. Seven nights, a, seven fucking nights a week, three, four hours of my life. No, I, I dedicate three hours once a week. For NFL season, that's literally all I do. One yeah. team, that's it. That's time I set aside. But 
I don't, I'm not trying to, I'm not watching the NFL draft. I'm not out here fucking reading ESPN, following yeah, yeah, yeah. every trade, like wasting all this fucking time on all this bullshit. I'd rather build money. I'd rather fucking build a foundation yeah. to make money and wealth and yeah. set myself up for freedom for the rest of my life. That's exactly right, man. And, and a lot of people will say to me, well, I agree with you, Andrew, but what do I do if my friends don't talk about money? And I say, well, you need some new friends. Find, find some, some new friends. fucking friends. Find some friends who want to talk about money and sit and talk about money all the time. And you might come up with an idea and maybe you can launch it together. And before you know it, you'll have money. So you're not going to have, and if you don't prioritize something, it's not going to enter your life. And money is exactly the same. Uh, what, uh, what do you have to say about um, adapting and pivoting in business? And, you know, I could tell you for me personally, starting off, I had this vision of what I'm going to offer and my niche and everything. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to sell a podcasting solution. I'm going to help all businesses and brands like start, manage, grow, produce, promote their own podcast. Boom, this yeah. is going to be the thing. Then this COVID thing hit and I realized, you know what? Fuck. Like I got to pivot too. I'm going to help yeah. people put courses and stuff online and manage that whole solution. And yeah. the podcast can be something packaged in that and stuff like that. What are yeah. some of the things you've had to pivot to uh, and change in, in your businesses as well to just kind of stay, stay with bro, the I've done, Bro, man, I've done everything. I've, I've run so many different companies and they've all changed all the time. And on, on, on CobraTape.com in my house's university, there's a hundred lessons and it's a hundred stories and a hundred lessons in business. And basically I've got to a point now where I've run so many different kinds of companies. It doesn't matter what company I try and run. I approach it exactly the same. I approach all of my businesses the same way. And that's what hustlers university teaches you, which is my blueprint on how to start a business with nothing. Cause I don't believe I've never started a business with investment. Every single business I've started, I'll start with basically zero. Yeah. Besides you should be able to start with, with nothing. Yeah, right? With nothing. The only ones I've invested money in, is to casinos. And the only reason I'm doing that is because I'm already rich. So like, it's different to run a business when you're already rich than when you don't have money. It's different. But like one of the very simple philosophies inside the Hustlers University, because people will come to me and say, why should I buy that? And I say, look, it took me a long time to learn all these lessons and I lost a whole bunch of money to learn them. You can learn it the very easy way. But one of the simple lessons, I'll give you a very simple example is people come to me and they say, oh, I want to run a jewelry business, for example. I want to run a jewelry store. So Tate, I need to borrow 200000 dollars. And I say, why? They say, oh, I need to get jewelry made. And when the jewelry is made, I need to get it imported. And then I need to do some marketing and then da, 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 da. And I say, look, here's how I would run a jewelry company. I would get a website. I'd get pictures. I put the jewelry pictures on the website and I would do whatever I thought I was going to do to get sales in my Instagram posts, whatever, whatever. And two, one of two things are going to happen. I'm going to get sales or I'm not. Now, if I get sales, then I don't have any stock because I, I didn't waste any money. But then you can send them an email, apologize, say there's a delay, blame COVID or blame something else, promise them a free gift, yeah. you know, whatever. And, and then you can use money you've already brought in to get supply of jewelry and take money you've already earned and provide the product. The other way is, or, or the other thing happens, you put the website up and no one buys. Well, if you put the website up and no one buys, you're going to be very happy you didn't spend 200 grand on fucking stock. No risk. So, like, so, so, so there's no need to spend the 200 grand on stock. There's no need for it. People have their yeah. whole mentality towards business the wrong way around. If you want to sell something, sell it first, buy it after, you know, like if, if people don't yeah. understand, like I've run so many companies. I've started with zero just to I had a good idea and a way to market it. And that's usually enough. You don't need money to start companies. Thousand percent, man. I've caught myself um, doing some of the same, same shit where it's like, you know, someone will be like, Hey, can you do this thing? I'm like, hell yeah, of course I could do that thing. Never done that fucking thing in my life, yeah. but I figure out a way. Yeah, you know, that's that's, right. the, that, that's how you gotta fucking do it, man. And then I do the thing, and it's all yeah. good. And I'm like, you know what? That was easy. I yeah. can build that shit in too. So, I love that, man. Uh, obviously, we we've been going almost an hour now. I don't want to keep this thing too long. Um, yeah, I'm sure we could we could go for hours, and I'm gonna have you back on again for sure. And uh, you know. Uh, when I'm in Europe, I'll come link up with you for sure. And then when you're here in Canada, you're always welcome as well. I like 100%. to kind of end my podcast with a lightning round. Five okay. quick questions, uh, okay. you know, just because I find it's a little less fucking awkward to just be like, all right, peace, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> question number one. What's the craziest place you've ever had sex? Craziest place I've ever had sex. Okay. Yeah, whether it be public or like some badass building or fucking is it public i don't know that you caught me by surprise with that one i'm trying to think i don't know if there's anything that crazy maybe i'm boring i never considered myself boring maybe ah 
beach. Wait, I, I fucked two Russians on a beach in Ionapa. Okay. Got, yeah, I don't know. You got that. caught. Yeah, the, so the fucking Cypriot cop came. I gave him like a hundred euro. That's and then we so had, funny, man. And then we had to, long story short, the taxi that dropped us there left. So I had to walk back with the two Russian girls about five kilometer walk. <laughs> And they were complaining at me. Oh, you said the taxi would wait. But I'd already fucked them by then, so I was completely impatient. I was like, well, You're done. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is what it is. Just shut up. Let's walk. And that's, I guess that's the story. Question number two. Uh, your Lambo Urokan or the McLaren 720S? Which one do you prefer? Ah, man. You can't make me choose. It's like choosing Bond the Brunette. <laughs> they're, they're both beautiful. I don't know. They, they're, they're good at different if things. If you had to pick to one and burn one, man, which okay. one? If I had to pick one, I'd pick the heart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, number three, if kickboxing was not your sport, what would it be? Fighting in general would have been any fighting sports. If fighting. Okay. Let's say no sport. MMA. Let's say MMA is out of the picture. You had to pick like a team sport or like fucking tennis or some bullshit. If I was not a fighter, I would probably want to be race car driver, maybe maybe okay. driving cars, but I think I'm too big for that. Cause you have to be small to do that. Right. I'm, right. Right. I'm like six, I'm like six, three. So I think I'm too big, too big and too sexy. But oh well. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, advice you would give to 17 year old Tate. 17 year old Tate was pretty motivated. He had his head on his shoulders. I'm thinking back. I never really made any large mistakes in my life. I always understood the value of hard work. That doesn't um, mean you couldn't, uh, if you could go giving advice, like even if it's like, keep going, like anything, advice doesn't have to be like, you're fucking yeah. up. Like advice can be positive as well, man. Well, yeah, you know, you know what, if I could do my life again, the only mistake I made is I wouldn't have done kickboxing. I would have done boxing. I would have told 17 year old Tate mm. to change to boxing because I was fucking good and I could have made millions. Damn. Right? I still made millions of money. You day. still made millions. <laughs> Last and final question before we close out, brother. How do you want to be remembered? That's a good question. And I think the most important thing is that I'm remembered by people close to me and people who know me absolutely. I don't give a shit what the internet says. I don't give a shit what people on Twitter say. I don't care how much people insult me on Reddit for my views, whatever. None of these people matter to me. And a lot of people say they don't care what people think, but I genuinely mean it. I promise you, I couldn't give a fuck. The people who are close to me, the people who I'm mentoring, the people who I'm helping, my own family, I just want them to remember me as exactly what I am, which is a competent individual which says what, says what he means, means what he says, and gets shit done. And I think that's base, the basis of being a man in, in the modern world. Brother, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Shout out your social media or anything you want to promote, you know, before that gets banned as well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> my, my, Twitter, my Twitter always gets banned. Uh, it's, it's, it's a weird handle right now because it always gets banned. It's of Wudan, O-F-W-U-D-A-N, because I can't put my name or they're going to ban me instantly. My uh, Instagram is at Cobra Tate, T-A-T-E, and my website is CobraTate.com, and you can go there to learn everything I know about everything. And I've had some huge success stories on the website as well about guys who are now running cam companies in Singapore and making millions of dollars and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to get involved, just check it out. Absolutely, brother. Appreciate you. Thanks for taking the time. And just remember, it's not that deep. <laughs> <Real good. laughs> Thanks, brother. Peace.